Let's see. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so uh, we have a couple of approvals of the agenda. May I get a motion for the approval of tonight's agenda? Motion to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, first on the agenda is the approval of the open session minutes from September 9th, 2019. Um, can I get a, a motion for that? Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, so the next item on the agenda is student comments. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you guys for having me here tonight. And uh, here are the uh, school committee comments for September 23rd, 2019. This Friday, we had about 50 guests from the National Defense University visit NITMUC for the day. The group is made up of top-ranking military officers from countries around the world. They're selected by their own countries to come to the, natural, to the National Defense University so they can study international relations and get to know American culture. The NDU comes each year in order to learn about American schools. After they met with Mr. Clements and Mrs. Moran for a briefing on American education, they were matched up with students and spent the day shadowing NITMUC students, including having lunch in the cafeteria. Actually, about that, they got to go to uh, they got to go to second lunch as opposed to third lunch, which was um, that was something else. Especially when you're in the middle of math class and all of a sudden, bam, half the students aren't there. <laughs> but I mean, you really can't complain about it. It's a great experience. Um, next on next talking point is the uh, food for thought lunches and lead learner workshop. Lead learner workshops. Um, Last week, NITMUC held its first lead learner workshop of the year. These are the leadership meetings that are open to all students and teachers. This week, we're holding our first Food for Thought lunch of the year. Over the course of the past two years, more than 400 students and 50 educators have participated in these events, which generate conversation, feedback, and ideas about our culture, programs, and future. Homecoming weekend is coming up, and I'm sure that we're all pretty excited about that. I know I am. Um, homecoming takes place this weekend, and we're getting ready for homecoming with Spirit Week. Today was America Monday, Tuesday is Pajama Day, Wednesday is Weird Sock Day, Thursday is Boston Sports Day, and Friday is Nipmuc Spirit Day. There's a pep rally Friday afternoon for all of our sports teams that are playing at home over the course of the weekend. On Friday night, there will be a pasta dinner free of charge for all students, beginning at 6 p.m. in the cafeteria. On Saturday, the homecoming dance will take place from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. in the Nipmuc Gym. And that concludes the student report. Again, thanks for having me. Very Thank good, you. very good. So, do we have a number of sports playing on Friday? Um, we have we a do. great deal of sports. I know that we have a uh, we have a football game. I believe we have a soccer game, no? So we have a soccer game as well as well as field hockey. I think we also have. Um, That's pretty good. Yeah, we have volleyball, volleyball too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we have a really large range of uh, sports that are playing this weekend. Yeah, so, great. yeah, it'll definitely be something to check out. Good. Mr. Schmidt definitely stacks it. Excellent. Oh, definitely. So next up on the agenda is uh, thank you, by the way. Oh. Great to have you back. <laughs> oh, thank you. And I'm, I'm so proud that during the summer months you really worked on that camera presence. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> nice job, Owen. Um, next on the agenda, community comments. Do I have any community comments for this evening? No? Okay, moving on. Superintendent's comments. Okay, good evening. Um, so first off, just a, a bunch of different updates. Uh, I know at the last school committee meeting I presented on the proposed, uh, what, what is the title of it, uh, Leading Edge Charter School. That was a proposal that was submitted to DESE um, during the summer months, and I talked about uh, a potential threat that it could be, particularly with regard to our funding. Um, and as I noted, we were still super, super early in the process. Um, as I forwarded to you last week, we received word on Wednesday 
that um, the commissioner is not even considering it for a final application. So um, for all intents and purposes, it's completely stopped in the process. So uh, for now, we don't have to be concerned uh, about a potential drain on our resources. So good news for Menden Upton, I'm pleased to report. Uh, second piece is um, something that we discussed a little bit during the last meeting um, when we were going over the district action plans, but we're really, really excited that this year, uh, the concept that we've done over the last four and a half years at NITMA with regard to the 21st Century Learning Conferences is going to be uh, spread to all four schools district-wide. So we're referring to them as Inspired Learning Days, and we have two tentative dates, December 11th and April 15th. And uh, we're in the process now of planning and doing some of the brainstorming to ensure that in all four buildings, we will be pursuing uh, topics of interest for our students, but also making those connections within the community. So you will very shortly see in all four buildings, all calls to our parents and to community members to come in and uh, facilitate different sessions for our students. So super, super exciting news. Uh, kind of in the same vein, um, I'd like to kind of give a hat tip to our NIPMA co-principals, John Clements and Mary Ann Moran. Um, I included in your packet a grant that they submitted to MUF for uh, learning adventures, pre-K through 12 which is kind of the same type of vision of our Inspired Learning Days, except kind of something a little bit more extended, but really kind of connecting it across multiple grade levels. So the vision is having uh, a team of approximately 24 students and six to eight educators across the levels, kind of plan something that is community-based, that stretches across different content areas and has careful alignment with the uh, six portrait of a learner competencies. So uh, that planning process has begun and we are in the process of kind of doing some planning of rolling out of how it will look as far as the application process for educators that would be involved with it and also students involved with it. So again, super exciting news. Kind of um, on that same lines of good news and things that we're excited about, we got great news last week that John Hansen, who is uh, one of our art teachers at the middle school, has been named the 2020 Massachusetts Art Educators Association Middle Level Art Educator of the Year. So I think this is a, a tremendous honor uh, from John's professional organization and in being recognized as an exemplary educator who demonstrates outstanding support to students, advocacy to, for the arts, and engagement with the community. Um, so he will be recognized at the uh, state conference on uh, November 9th, and I think it really kind of speaks to the quality of our entire art program in the district. If you keep in mind that uh, Alice Gentile won this award, I believe it was six or seven years ago, and actually she's been recognized as a national uh, middle level art educator of the year. So kudos to John and kudos to the program. And then last but not least, uh, I'll damp down the good news and the excitement. Um, I included in your packet um, a couple different handouts, a fact sheet, and also kind of a technical summary of the bill. I'm sure you're all cognizant. Uh, also last Wednesday, the legislature's Joint Committee on Education re uh, released something known as the Student Opportunity Act, which is the long-awaited Foundation Budget Review Commission uh, bill to address the FBRC recommendations, which realize have now been pending for four years. Um, it generally is being uh, very much praised because keep in mind, um, it envisions over a seven year span adding about $1.4 billion to Chapter 70 funding. However, keep in mind, um, 
as we discussed last spring and the different competing ideas that were out there, the largest uh, amount of new aid will be going to districts where there's a high percentage of low income students and a high percentage of English language learners. Um, I'm sure we will be getting a more of the uh, formal analyses of the bill, um, and I'm sure people like uh, Mass Budget will be doing breakdowns by district to see uh, different projections of what we could be looking at for FY21 and beyond. Um, but you know, I, I, I want to underscore, and I know we've had this discussion before, that um, we can't really anticipate seeing a lot of new state funding from this. And as we've kind of consistently talked about, particularly during the budget process, really the solution to um, some of our challenges, I, I think, are going to remain at the local level. That you know that 70% piece of funding will be coming, will continue to come from our two communities. I do think uh, some things are noteworthy in it. Um, one, it will be establishing uh, the minimum aid. It'll go up from the whopping $20 per student to $30 per student each fiscal year. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we talked about just last meeting, is, uh, the whole issue of charter school funding and charter school reimbursement it is saying within a three-year span, they will follow through on the promise of 100% reimbursement in the first year, 50% reimbursement in the second year, and then 25% uh, years three through five. And probably the most significant piece that could be a positive driver is establishing a schedule for reimbursement of out-of-district transportation for special education students, for our students who are in out-of-district placement. So uh, according to this bill, it's a five-year proposal, and starting in FY21, this coming fiscal year, 25% of the cost will be reimbursed, and then over the span of four years, I'm sorry, it's four years, not five years, it would increase by 25% every year to uh, the point of FY24 being 100% reimbursement. So that is very good news, seeing that for uh, our, at present time for out of district, um, out of district transportation, we're spending approximately a million dollars. So uh, that is positive news for all school districts. Um, and then kind of thinking forward, one, one piece, um, I think we've had the discussion about the, the, the really the pressing needs facility-wide across the district where we're kind of on borrowed time for this building with regard to a new roof. We know the multitude of facility issues that we have at Misco Hill Middle School. Um, the bill would also lift the, the cap uh, on allocation for MSBA funding from annual, from 600 million to 750 million in school building projects. So that's positive news as well. So I am hearing from, um, from leadership of the Superintendents Association that uh, the legislature is very much looking to fast track this and uh, would love to have this wrapped up by the end of October. So that's extremely quick. Um, so that this would be going into effect for FY21. Okay. okay, and that's my report. So I, so I have a question. I have sure. a question about that last one. So is there, will we have an idea about that at the end of October when they, when they pass it so we'll have better? Absolutely, I, I would say probably before, um, Probably by the end of this week, I know from at least the Superintendents Association and also the School Committee Association, you will see various analyses done. And I'm sure Noah Berger and the folks at Mass Budget are, will also do the same analysis. Okay. And by fast track, they'll probably, um, if you've read any of the press accounts, they're starting in the Senate for the approval process and then backing down to the House 
if you recall when uh, not this past spring but the spring before when the process failed it failed in the house it didn't fail in the Senate so um, you will probably see starting possibly tomorrow Wednesday the amendment process which will be relatively quick probably a week maximum and then go to the full Senate for for approval. It already has been approved unanimously, unanimously by the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Okay. So so that has the potential of having an impact on our budget for next year. For FY21. Yeah. Okay. But again, very, very modestly, because if you recall, the Chapter 70 monies and the changes in the Chapter 70 formula are for economically disadvantaged. And across the district, we're right around 10%. It's for English language learners. Across the district, we have a little under 30 students. So it's not anything that is a great mover. Except for the special education. Which is very positive, yeah. correct. OK, good, understood. Does this touch like the regional transportation issue at all? Does that not touch it at all. Is that something that's potentially addressed by this Rural Schools Commission? No, the Rural Schools Commission is something that was probably more looking at do they actually create some variation of Chapter 70 formula for rural schools? And I think one of the issues is we are technically not defined as a rural school. We're more defined as a suburban school. Unfortunately. Okay, thank you, Joe. Yeah. Um, next on the agenda is the administrator's comments. Dr. Cohen. Hi, everybody. Hi, I have some gifts for you. I'm going to be talking about. So, thanks for the opportunity to give you an update about how we've started off the school year in regard to our PD mentoring and some of the curriculum work that we've begun. harassment, 
um, cyberbullying. So we've gone through all of those and um, we're allowing, we're extending it through our next PD day so our staff can have enough time to work through those modules. So that was another piece of what we did on the day as well. Um, one of the questions we asked the staff prior to the opening day was what can you do to create conditions where our learners thrive? So I wanted to share with you uh, some of the responses that our teachers had. And you can see this is like a Wordle, so a uh, word cloud, when you have people saying the same word more often, it will be bigger. So you can see the focus in the middle there is having empathy, love, and courage, support, um, challenging, connecting, care, relationships. So we talked about how um, with our staff, you didn't have, um, we weren't throwing MCAS up there, we weren't talking about AP tests, we weren't talking about assessments, we were talking about the relationships that we want to build with our students, so I wanted to share that with you. And uh, a lot of what we talked about and worked on was how to establish a great start to the school year with our students. A couple of quotes, we had an opening session just about staff wellness that um, I facilitated in the first hour and I wanted to share just a couple of the activities that we did so you get a sense of what people liked. Um, everyone received this folder and this was when you receive notes. Um, many teachers over the years will receive notes from parents or students and usually people will have a, a place where they keep those notes so we gave everyone that to make sure that they had something that they could hold on to, notes that they received or gratitude in the folder and you can open it up if you want. There are some cards in there where we ask them to write a note of gratitude to someone else, one of their colleagues, and maybe save one later on in the year. Uh, we talked about how excited we are at the beginning of the year, but how it can be um, difficult sometimes when we hit March and we're in the middle of winter, so they had to write a letter to themselves, a note to themselves that we can reflect upon when we hit that March and winter. And we talked about reframing, which is what the right hand um, example is of how, yes, we you know, have to do power school training. There's some mandated trainings that we have to do, but trying to reframe our language around we get to. So we talked that really has resonated. It, um, people are still talking about that. And in there, you'll see that there is a, a rock in, in there that says inspire. So our district intention with our strategic plan is to inspire. So that's our district intention, but we had other rocks and asked uh, the teachers and staff to reflect upon what other intentions they might have in the year to set intentions. And we also did a breath, and that was kind of a lead into a lot of the mindfulness work that we're doing and aligns with our social emotional learning um, that we've been focused a lot on the last couple of years. So it was a really nice start to the year. So I wanted to share that with you and give you your own rock um, in there as well and gratitude cards. Um, so we're already, it's surprising, but we're already in there for um, our planning for October 11th. And um, per the contract, one of the full PD days is a teacher-directed professional development day. And a few years back when we started it, we typically had it on the March day. Last year, we swapped it and tried out the October day. And overwhelming teachers said that was a perfect time of year to be able to collaborate together, to work on uh, preparations. They felt that it had more impact to do it at the beginning of the year. Uh, what it means is we're, there's a lot that we're getting um, planned out right as we start the school year. And so already we have a lot of requests that have come in for restraint training. Um, we have some Medicaid training updates, some assessment training. So you can see the whole list here. We have uh, some of our members are offering workshops. So I see Diane Borgades here. She's, she's gonna be presenting a training that our new teachers requested related to frontline system um, for special ed. We also have history teachers or math teachers and they came together and said, can you please find someone to come in and, and do a presentation on a particular resource. So you have, this is just the initial range right now, all of the proposals are coming in and then we are, um, will be communicating that out. They sign up and it's a mixture of collaborative, external, so many teachers go externally to um, music institutes at Foxborough or to observe teachers that might be in our counselors and, and other um, school systems. And we're also, you'll see the mental health first aid training. We ran this this summer and uh, this is with a partnership through the Shrewsbury Family Youth Services and it's um, free right now because they have a grant. And so we booked them and we're offering it out to our Blackstone Valley uh, friends and colleagues and 
the area as well to send some of their teachers over. So the, I, I attended at the summer of that summer. And then you have your first aid certification mental health. So it's a nice range and um, the pictures there are some of our community members this last week from the brainstorming around our goals to be here. And just a reminder, I know we mentioned this at the end of last year, but we um, are continuing with the Excel network again this year. And we have three choices of types of cohorts we want to be a part of and we determined as a team when we want to be working on the embedding at the online classroom. And we've already started some work in embedding SEO practices in our classrooms, but we thought this would be a, a great opportunity for us to have more teachers involved and to bring back some of those strategies that we can start applying. Part of this, you can see the team has grown. We can only send 10 to each meeting, meeting so we rotate through um, different teachers and administrators to make sure we have representatives from all the buildings. And our goals this year in our strategic plan, you'll see that um, and I know they'll talk about it, the establishment of SEL school-wide um, committees. And so with those SEL committees, some of the members are going to go back from the Excel network, um, bring back the strategies they learned, and then bring it over to their school-wide commi committees and share those practices. And we also have teachers who are volunteering to pilot some of the strategies too, which is a piece of you may have seen this in some of the notices I've sent out, but over the summer we had a number of book studies, and we always try to align our book studies with some of the themes and work that we're doing in districts to support our work. And currently we're finishing up Mindfulness for Teachers that went August through September, and we're just finishing that up. That was an excellent book. Um, Mindful by Design was in July, project-based teaching, I believe that was July or August. And onward, we provided that book for all of our teachers this year, and that is about cultivating emotional resilience in educators. And we're doing work, this is a year-long book study. And so in my weekly um, memos and updates I sent out, I'm pulling from some of these books of self-care practice, but also you'll see in the faculty meetings that they're gonna be doing work. There's a workbook that goes along with it, and the leadership team is reading it as well, um, that we're gonna have continued ongoing work with this. And it, what's nice about it, it's specific to educators and there's a lot of strategies for what leaders can do and what educators can do in different areas, um, which we're, the hope is then once you were familiar with it, then it will transfer into the classroom and we're working with our students. With our mentoring new teacher induction, there haven't been any um, major changes from last year, but just to let you know some of the highlights of how we run this program, it's a pretty robust program. We have uh, many new teachers this year and all of them are assigned a one-to-one -one mentor that we have, we brought in last year new teacher workshops that are after school. And so they're on various topics. Again, Diane presented to them uh, recently, a presenter extraordinaire over there. And uh, she presented on the IEP process, which they really wanted to learn more about. We have um, parent um, engagement is one of the topics, managing minutia, lesson planning assessments. So we have a number of workshops this year. We also, uh, mentors will observe them and they will observe mentors or other teachers throughout the year. We have one book study that we'll be doing with them and we have one collaborative mentor mentee meeting. So that's for our new teachers in their first year. For year two mentoring, uh, that would be teachers that are here for their second year. And we have three professional learning days and we've been doing, we're about in our third year now of this, where we collaborate with Ashland and Milford, and we bring all of the teachers together who are in their second year. In the morning, they go out and do classroom observations. So we send them out whatever district we're in. So if they're middle school teacher, they're out in middle school classrooms. And we try to match them up as best as we can with their content areas. We come back, we debrief. There's usually a topic we're looking for. So for example, student agency is one of them that we've done the last couple of years. We give them prompts. They go out, they look, look at it, come back, we debrief, and then we have a workshop in the afternoon where we give them a little bit more content. Um, we also have some book studies that are through Google Classroom that we do cross district, and um, it's gone really well the last couple of years. And uh, in year three right now, that's with Milford and Mendenupton, and we just do two days, 
one book study that looks a little different, but the format of the two days are, are kind of similar. And with our mentors, we have, um, mentors are trained every five years, and they have to go for a refresher, and we have mentor meetings, so we have next one tomorrow. We have quarterly meetings with them where we work with them to support their work as mentors. For the curriculum update, um, on the right-hand side, I'm gonna begin there. Last year, um, we had a health PE, a wellness curriculum review team that met monthly all year and did a review of their curriculum and programming. We also had a social studies group that met, and the reason why we had social studies last year is we have new state standards that have just been released. And we, our goal is to set up a time this fall to present those curriculum reviews, so maybe at an October meeting or November meeting, whatever seems to work in the schedule, um, I'll present and we'll present to you the reports and highlights of the reviews. And from that will be some proposed action steps that they can work on. And the goal is to start having these reviews and rotating through every five years. And so you would do the full year of the self-study and then you would start to work on some of those action steps and then you would come back to it. This year we have slated to work on ELA for curriculum review, also a focus on reading in special ed. Um, reading supports and to look at art because there are new standards coming out or that just came out some draft standards and that's what we have slated I'm still going to be coordinating with um, representatives from all the schools to see when we can do that and we'll probably get that up and running at some point around October or towards the end of October um, we are piloting some resources just to let you know in grade 6 and 7 we're piloting piloting social studies resources um, from McGraw-Hill that are aligned to our Massachusetts standards. So we're trying those resources out. And in grades one and three, we are piloting Reading Wonders. Um, we've been using Reading Wonders 2014. There's already been one update that came out in 2017. The teachers really like Reading Wonders, so there wasn't um, the sense that we wanted to have a, a giant um, you know, presentation review of all resources, but we wanted to try this out and pilot this out, but we will be looking at resources in general through our curriculum review. So we're pil piloting that in two grades. And we also have the, our new course of the grade eight civics, and they have a resource that is matched to their new course. Um, and that's because the frameworks have changed for social studies and it used to be world history at that eighth grade and now it is civics. And so they have a new resource. So just wanted to give you a, a heads up of some of the shifts that have been taking place and some of our, there are many more taking place, but those are a couple of highlights we've been working on. And that's all I had for tonight. I welcome any questions. We're off and running. Very good. All right. Any questions? Thank you, Maureen. Okay, next on the agenda is the uh, updates from the subcommittees. Budget sub subcommittee is the real update. Um, I guess I can give a little update on that. Sure. i hand it off to you. Sure. So, so we discussed uh, as part of our subcommittee, uh, budget subcommittee review program throughout this season, uh, we're going through each individual aspect of the MERSD budget. Uh, this was focused on uh, the special education portion. So we went over all the aspects, which are the costs and, uh, and the structure of how we um, actually use the, the revenue that we get for that specific area of the budget. One, um, one aspect of this is that we are talking about roughly 25% of the budget here when we're talking about special ed. So um, with that, I'll hand it to you for sure. Any comments? No, um, just I, it, it, in your packet is a, a copy of the presentation that uh, Dennis and Jay put together, I think what they did was an exemplary job because it was very concise, but kind of got to the heart of the matter of what are our major cost drivers, what's the vision of the program, and what are some of the critical needs moving forward. So I think they very aptly identified uh, what the vision is and what our, our, our needs are and so on. Um, you know, I, I, I think it, made a lot of sense, particularly for this one to be our very first 
of this series of meetings. Just like you identified, Sean, special education is approximately 25% of our budget. It is very much a significant expense. Um, so as I say in the background notes, uh, we will continue these series of meetings. They are scheduled approximately every three weeks. And the next one will be Tuesday, October 8th at Clough at 7 p.m. to um, delve into student transportation, which is another large budget driver. And just emphasize that these are all being set up special for this year, and we're being very focused about each area of the budget to be completely transparent and also to give as much information out about the decisions we make on budgeting within the school district. Any other questions? Uh, we had quite a few people there. We had participants there from uh, um, CPAC. CPAC. We also had uh, uh, a few people there from the town. There was also Men's and Finance Committee was represented. Um, and we had um, Jay Byer, myself, and, and Lee. And we also had, uh, am I forgetting anyone? Oh, often FinCom is also represented. Yeah. Um, so, so they're pretty much the town organizations were all represented there between both towns. All right, so moving on. Um, new business, uh, presentation of the 2019-2020 Misco Hill and Nipmuc School Improvement Plans. So as we usually do uh, at this meeting and the next meeting, um, Right after you've approved the district action plans, we'd like to have a concise overview of what uh, each school is thinking with regard to their school improvement plans. Um, so tonight, uh, we will cover the middle school and uh, the high school, and then the next meeting, uh, we'll cover both elementary schools. Um, so we have our principals here. Unfortunately, Jen Mannion is super ill with the flu and is flat out, um, but we're in great hands with Paul Marshall. So Paul, take it away. Hey, folks. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Let me see if I actually move to this. I love this slide because it yeah. is an amazing shot from the rainbow. Uh, when are we going to rip up the gym to get the gold? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just uh, in relation to Jen, uh, she is incredibly sick, and uh, she was told by her doctors that she did not come anywhere near here to a fever brace, and it took uh, an army to keep her out of here. They get well, Jen, hopefully, you're feeling better. Uh, just wanted to let you know that you know tonight we're you know presenting the plan in the draft form. Uh, this kind of came together with all of our work last year with our school uh, advisory council, uh, as well as cross blocking with the district improvement plan. And I work with the School Advisory Council, it was very powerful and inclusive. Um, it's one of the things that uh, when Jen came on board, we talked about how do we make our School Advisory uh, Council some, something of a, a, a really a, a mover in our building. Um, and I know that uh, we had these conversations going way back, and uh, we're really, really uh, thankful of all the work that everybody did because it really has been uh, the driving force for our school. It really has. Uh, so, uh, again, we're going to be getting that work back together again in October. Um, so what we feel we're presenting tonight is a, is a continuation of the work that we started last year. Uh, the lines of the district improvement is, and will be vetted uh, by our school uh, advisory council when they reconvene uh, at the end of uh, October. So it's kind of a continuation of work and moving forward. Um, so we're reviewing our goals from last year. We had a lot of challenges, and like the rainbow, uh, you don't experience a uh, rainbow level storm. So I think that we really dug into the work. Uh, people really challenged each other. Uh, at the end of the year, we did a uh, red, green, and yellow process of taking a look at where we felt we were in relation to meeting our goals from last year. Uh, happy to say that most of the things were either the yellow or green. A lot of things were completed. We started it and we finished it. Uh, there are certain things that, uh, frankly, to be, to be you know, up front and open, uh, we didn't start. Uh, so some of those things will be carried over. I think that an improvement plan needs to be a dynamic kind of process. Uh, so the expectation that we're going to start it and finish everything, I don't think that that's realistic. So some of those things will be uh, going over to this year as well. Uh, some of the highlights of the uh, accomplishments that we felt that uh, came from this plan, uh, one is the Inspired Learning Center, uh, which opened up this summertime, uh, in partnering with Project Lead Away, as well as um, summer work with renowned educators like Ara Sokol and Pam Moran, uh, as 
spearheaded by, um, by Dave Quinn, really helped uh, not only the community really get a sense of what our center is going to be, but also helped us to really brand it and really think about what it is that we wanted it to be. Uh, so it was a real good jump off. Uh, Officer Cinco coming with us uh, last year was a great addition to our, um, our whole school community. Uh, taking the lead in student safety uh, committee and also training our staff in dynamic alternatives to lockdowns really, I think, uh, helped us to really rethink how do we keep ourselves safe, how do we keep our community safe, how do we be proactive in some really um, challenging and interesting times. So Officer Cinco has had, has had a great uh, influence on our community. And of course, our tremendous relationship with the community through the Week Here uh, MISCO uh, program, which has just been absolutely insane. Uh, over 800 hours this summer of, um, of volunteer work to help transform our space. Um, and it's just been an absolutely tremendous uh, experience. This is a, a picture of our staff uh, for a couple of days uh, wearing our week here, uh, Miss Go shirts. And uh, you can see by people's faces, it's just a, it's a, it's a different sense in our school. Uh, it's, it, it, people just are genuinely, if you're really zooming on it, people are smiling and it's, it's a genuine uh, kind of. Uh, so thank you for all the community really stepping up. Uh, it's, it's, it's really great when you see it happening. Because a lot of times people say, oh, sure, sure, I'll, I'm more than happy to help out. Uh, but people really, really stepped up, and it's going to continue moving forward. So we really look forward to working with them. Um, so getting right into our three strategic objectives that we've uh, uh, presented for tonight. First one is supporting social emotional learning. Uh, we started the work looking at our school through the lens of PDIS, which is the Positive Behavioral Intervention Systems last year. Uh, and that work included sur uh, surveying uh, and dialoguing students, teachers, parents, uh, school advisory council members. Uh, and we came up with norms for our school and our school community. And they basically came under seven different areas, those being uh, different domains, the classroom, hallways, cafeteria, uh, bathroom, locker rooms, playground outside, bus and assemblies. And we adopted the we are squared E grades, and that stands for the R period, R squared E, uh, stands for achievement, respect, responsibility, and empathy. Uh, the different areas that we came up with was, well, how are we expecting ourselves to act in all these particular areas? And rather than imposing, you will do, and if you don't, this is what's going to happen, uh, we really talked to kids about, well, what's expected in these particular areas? How should you be acting? Uh, and then really start the dialogue on well, how do we talk to the students when they are doing it, and how do we praise them, and how do we talk to them when they are not, and how do we help them to bring them back into what they agree to on a social contract. Uh, one of the most powerful things we did in this show, uh, believe it or not, was to take a piece of red electric tape and run it down the middle of the hallway. And we had talked to kids about if you're moving through the building, I can see if I can find it because she experienced it, I think we all did. It was amazing. Uh, we talked about the kids moving from the right and going to the right. As soon as that red stripe was down, everything just moved to the right. Um, and it was a crazy simple thing. And sometimes in our world, it's crazy simple things that have the biggest impact <coughs> on our kids and our lives. So it's really about us talking about, well, how are we going to act and how are we going to do what we're going to be doing and really holding each other accountable for it. Um, so we'll develop data collection systems to uh, teams to analyze, well, how are we doing this? Is this actually going to see impact that we're looking for? Taking a look at things like this data, uh, time in classroom, um, are kids actually achieving a higher rate of high levels? Um, identifying patterns and trends that will determine the need for direct instruction of students and professional development for staff. So really, it's not just about the document. It's about how we build the document, what we do with it, how we take that information back, and how we help it to move our school. Uh, we've been working with staff to develop vocabulary to use with conversations that are consistent from teacher to teacher, so it's the same message, and that's who's looking at. Uh, I can remember uh, in my house, uh, it, it was Friday night, and it was time to go home. I knew that if my father was up, it was one conversation, and my mother was up, it was a totally different conversation. So we want to make sure as kids are hearing the same message from all of us, um, so that it can be consistent. And also, uh, it's easier for them to understand exactly what's expected of them. It's not like, gee, in front of this person, what am I supposed to do? Uh, we have begun our student handbook re revision committee, consisting of uh, teachers and students, and we'll, we'll be recruiting parents over the next couple of nights at our upcoming five and six and seven and eight open house. Uh, five and six is tomorrow night, and seven and eight is uh, Wednesday night. 
what we're looking for is really a critical eye of going through our handbook. I know the Gen I, it's been frustrating, I think it's been frustrating for the teachers too. Uh, that thing reads like a laundry list of uh, the worst person ever at least in the world. Uh, so we really want to have it to be more user friendly and talk about really what we're doing at schools is teaching kids through all of their experiences. And all of those experiences include how am I acting within my community? And how do you teach students to be able to be a more active and a, and a more positive influence not only in the school community, but again, as we're talking about this, this is really preparing kids for the larger world as, as we're existing in uh, the community and the society. So uh, that handbook and that revision committee is hopefully going through uh, from the top to bottom. Um, obviously, there are certain things that you guys um, have created in relation to policies. Uh, our kids are actually critically taking a look at some of those things, so they might be coming back and talking to you about some of the things that you guys have already heard too. So I'm looking forward to that dialogue with, with the students. Our sec second strategic objective is engaging the community as partners in learning. Um, so we're looking to establish a baseline for communication so all stakeholders know where to look while allowing teacher autonomy and adding layers of communication. So it's, it's a challenge because we are in the age of communication, but there are so many platforms and so many different ways to do that, that I think sometimes parents, students, teachers, faculty don't know where to look for and how to do it in a succinct manner. Uh, so we'll look to address how we will coordinate communication so we're supporting the social emotional wellness of our students. And if we align with uh, portrait of learner competencies, communication would cross academic and extracurricular so we don't over schedule students and send mixed messages about our core values and beliefs about learning. So it's really critical that, that we nail the whole communication. Uh, as an example, in this picture above, you see a student who's using uh, Seesaw to be able to communicate with their parents, uh, excuse me, their teachers. Uh, so uh, the way this works is this a student will uh, put something on here, sends it to the teacher, the teacher then will be able to, if you think of a Seesaw, you know, the student is, is the student that gives up that and the teacher then will be able to respond to that form. Uh, the other thing is, is that it creates this digital portfolio that will be there um, forever and parents also can tap into it. So if parents say, hey, what are you learning here? They can tap into it and say, well, here's a conversation I have with my, my teacher. Uh, so this is one example. Uh, so I think one of the things we were talking about with teacher autonomy is we want them to be able to play with these different things, to be able to come up with, is this actually getting us what we're looking for? And then as it, as it grows and turns into best practice, that's when we'll start to adopt it throughout the school. But we're still going to be seeing people kind of playing with things. So if everybody's looking for Seesaw, you won't find it in every classroom, but you're going to find different things. We're trying to find, uh, you know, it's going to be able to be uh, the students, but also be the parents. Uh, next one. Uh, the last is aligning practices to the mercy portrait of learner competencies. Um, so, uh, communication of the POL visually throughout the building, including the vision board, uh, which if you haven't been in this so lately, as you walk in the building, um, to the left hand side is a huge white board. It won't be white for a long time. Um, that's one of the things where, in cooperation with the BET or MISCO, is a, it was a, we're creating a vision board. And part of the vision board will be messaging uh, the uh, portrait of the learner in, in, in kind of a scattered word fashion, but it's really going to be getting all the different things that we're looking for. Um, and not only in that particular vision, but all sorts of other ways around the school. Uh, design and implement the inspired learning days that directly align with the EOL competencies. Uh, I want to publicly thank both principals, Mary and Marie, and Chuck Cummins for their work over the number of years for doing this. Uh, it's, it's great to have this snow plow just to follow the back lights, and they've done an amazing job over the last few years. So rather than recreate the wheel, um, really looking for them and thanking them for doing all the work that they've done at NEMA. And we're really excited about doing that work to scale not only this but also the elementary school. So again, thank you guys for doing your hard work. Uh, encourage the review of curriculum at all levels and focus for alignment with explicit teaching and assessment of PLL competencies. So again, we're challenging teachers to take a look at where in the curriculum is the low paying group, so to speak, where they can push in and really start digging into this. So it's, it's not just something that sits off to the side, so embedded in everyday uh, teaching and everyday experiences at our school. Uh, create curriculum and opportunities to expand the use of inspired intervention center uh, to include students at all grades and families. Right now, we've adopted 
this as a fifth and sixth grade initiative. And it's, uh, it's sitting in our technology uh, opportunities, but we have also three fellows, uh, who we're calling them, which are teacher ambassadors who are really going to be working with the, with the center to uh, encourage them to come down to the center when it's not being used as a classroom to really start to work on it. So it shouldn't be the standalone experience of trying to integrate it and embed it in everything we're doing in the school. Um, and that's kind of it. So just wanted to thank you. Um, our teachers don't sleep on the job, uh, but um, we are feeling very comfortable in our space. So again, I wanted to thank the uh, teacher who did the labor with us. Sorry about that. Uh, which would be Jen Manfamini, Rena Manser, uh, Kelly Wallet, Rob Cotton, Suzanne Blaylock, Wendy Morris, and Paul Schwab, who really put this together. And last but not least, thank you guys for everything. That's all I have. Any questions? Yeah, so, so um, for your for your action plan for the coming year. Yep. So. Um, uh, it would be nice to see all of the places where you might have had like red line items. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have. We have that document. So if, if the committee would like to see where we feel we are, yeah, I'd yeah, be yeah. more than happy to get that for yeah, you. Yeah, that'd be excellent. Definitely. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And yeah, Nick. Oh, sorry. Right. Since it's here. <laughs> How is everybody? Good. Thank you for the chance to present our school improvement plan. And it's good to follow Paul and hear about all the great stuff that's going on in MISCO. As uh, Mr. Marshall said, these plans are dynamic, and in order to be dynamic, they shouldn't be standalone. One year you do one thing, the next year you do something different. And so as we get started, we wanted to walk you through a little bit of the context of where we've been that's brought us to this point. Um, I, you gotta be careful about speaking in superlatives, and I feel like each year I'm coming in and speaking in superlatives, but I'm gonna do it again. I, I don't feel like there's ever been a better time to be an NITMOC student, and we're excited about the direction that we're headed, and we're gonna share some of that. So we're gonna quickly ping pong through a recap here to give you an idea of where we've been and where we're going. So you start with the big picture stuff. Um, Inspire, that was uh, put together by that great group of community folks. Our beliefs about learning, also our definition of learning, so while we were going through the district strategic planning process, NITMUC had a parallel process going on, and we saw awesome alignment between that. The idea of a call to action, which articulates the why, and why are we doing this work, and why are we thinking about school a little bit differently, and then the portrait of the learner. All this was out there, provided what is a really strong compass point to move forward, but um, what we were focused on last year was talking about it, understanding that compass point, but then also making some tangible progress. And we're pretty excited about the progress we've made. So another thing that we've talked about for a couple of years here at NIMBUC too is the idea of modern learning that's been driving a lot of work here. Um, and when we talk about modern learning, we talk about student agency, deep inquiry, and then the connections to real work that matters. So when the strategic plan came into play and had that alignment between what we had been talking about in modern learning and the strategic plan, it was just kind of fuel to the fire to keep moving in the direction that we were moving. Some exciting things have happened over the course of the last two years, which have provided structures for us to continue um, with a couple things. Food for Thought Lunches is an awesome way to continue in the student feedback loop, so we're continuing those again. Um, we're entering our third year of those, um, where twice a month we welcome students and teachers together to get feedback on the direction of the school. Our lead learner workshops, which are kind of flattening the leadership that any student and any teacher can come to. Again, so those structures are in place. We're entering our third year with lead learner workshops to drive the work of the school. And this year we're adding lunch and learns, the idea that our students have so much that they should be teaching, so providing time for our students to teach our teachers and other students, which is pretty exciting. Having those structures and platforms in place um, allows us to move and allows us to get all the voices in the school engaged in leading and exploring and trying new things. So one of the highlights of last year was that we were able to come up with a draft of the reflective tool for our um, portrait of a learner. So focused on I can statements, what students should be able to do. Uh, this was created in this room in a full day workshop with teachers, uh, about 30 students, including two middle school students, some graduates came back. It was a collaboration sort of across the NITMUC community. And what we ended up with was a really powerful statement of what it means to be a global citizen, what it means to be an inspired innovator. And then beyond that, we talked about approaching these differently, not assessing them and slapping another label like exemplary or proficient or needs improvement, 
but thinking in terms of reflection and thinking more aspirationally, where uh, faculty members would be providing feedback based in the form of what if, and I wonder. So what if you did this to take your idea to the next level? Or I wonder if you would consider X, Y, or Z. So focusing on that growth mindset and not the sense of it's done, it's completed, check it off, I put it on my transcript, but this continual cycle of learning. So last year, rather than trying to tie everything to the portrait of the learner as we were exploring it, we made the decision to tie it into our 21st century learning conferences as they existed. So our January date and our June date um, were both tied into each of the competencies. And our students had the opportunity to practice with the reflective tool. So we had a Google form, we, we pushed it out to all students, and then faculty members in their small group advisories were able to give some feedback. So we had the opportunity to do some piloting and looking forward to revisiting that tool this year and doing some work with that. And as Joe mentioned earlier, excited about the idea of expanding 21st century learning conferences, which will now be inspired learning days and will allow for collaboration K-12, which we're pretty excited about. Looking at the results of the 21st century learning conferences and all the kids reflecting using that tool, we ran a blind process looking at those reflections through a lead learner workshop with students and teachers together. And we pulled out stories from students that went beyond traditional achievement that showed what the portrait of a learner looks like when it comes to life. So we ended up with, I think, 32 students who we highlighted as portrait of the learner scholars, now portrait of the learner scholars, really focusing on that part of the inspire, the strategic plan that challenges us to come up with a new definition of success. We don't undervalue the AP scores, the SAT scores, the transcripts, that's all important, and they're door opening achievements for our kids, we know that. But we also know there's a lot more to our kids than what's on their transcript. And what you see when you look at the portrait of the learner scholars is that you've got kids who are bringing stories to life. Jaden, we just featured on the blog this past Friday. Jaden is an inspired filmmaker. He, I don't know if you've seen the, the feature yet, but you should check it out. What he can do with technology, he's taken on uh, being a director, he's using amazing technology, and he's telling stories in a way that looks like, as he said in the feature, low budget movies with a high budget look. And it's completely impressive. Beyond that, Jaden also, makes beats, so he gets his homework done, and then about 11 o'clock at night, he's on his computer, he's testing out new software, he's creating beats, he's putting them up on his SoundCloud for people to listen to, and he's putting them out for rappers to purchase and lay their vocal tracks over the beats that he's creating. If that doesn't get you excited about our kids, and if that's not an important part of their story, we're missing something. And there's a place for that in school. There's a place for us to incorporate that. Bryn is the next student that we featured of the 32 tonight. Bryn is a kid who has stepped up. She's always at a food for thought. She shows up at so many lead learner workshops. She's a student who's found her voice in leadership and she capitalizes on those, little, on those moments. In her portrait of a learner profile, she talks about being a third grader involved in a church fundraiser where they were getting supplies sent off to kids who were at the US-Mexico border. And how that has sparked a, a real passion for her about um, helping people to understand Syrian refugees and support them. Brenna is a kid with an amazing future, and she's a top achiever. She's a great leader. She's as polite as you can be. But with just looking at her in traditional metrics, you miss this important piece of the passion. I love some of her numbers that tell her story, too. 2017, year I attended the, uh, the Boston Women's March. So like trying to find these moments in the kids' lives that tell a unique story of who they are. We had 32. We believe that we've got 636 kids in this story, kids in school have a story to tell. Awesome, so the other piece that we've been working on, and this has been the last six years here at NITMUC, is the idea of model um, student learning and professional growth goals, which has helped to um, drive the practice of our teachers. So we have amazing teachers here who constantly step up. And these have been developed not all at once. They started with technology integration, actually, back when we adopted one-to-one -one in order to come together, find a way for teachers to collaborate, to do the work that's meaningful to them, tied into our school improvement plan and the strategic plan, but work together. Um, and over the course of the years, we have an average of, I would say, about 90% that adopt one of these goals over the course of the year, and we'll talk about the new one for this year. Um, but this has been kind of a powerful piece of having everyone moving in the same direction here as well. Beyond that, we worked uh, to get to the departments. We spent a lot of time last year talking about our beliefs about learning, our definition of learning, which sounds dry, but we get excited about it. <laughs> um, meeting in small groups to help departments figure out what resonates with them about our guiding documents and where they can take it forward. So on our NITMUC Learn site, that's been, been primarily internal. 
you can see the protocols we did with each department and the different ideas that we come up with. What's really powerful is as they set their individual goals or focus area for this coming year, they're finding different aspects, whether it's interdisciplinary or connecting it to the real world, um, different aspects that align with who we are and what we believe, but really reflects the character and the interest and the curiosities of the professionals in our school. So we come to the thank you slide, and I'm gonna sort of take Paul's thank you and deflect it to our teachers. Um, we've got amazing people. We're really fortunate we get to be sort of the ambassadors of the school, and we recognize that we're in front of people regularly talking about the school, but we don't want it to be confused about what's, where this work is happening. It happens in the classrooms. It happens when you have, you're getting ready for our ninth 21st century learning conference. That's teachers saying, sure, I'll take kids to an Italian restaurant and teach them how to cook in an Italian kitchen. I'll make the contact with that professional. I'll figure out the transportation. I'll get them there. I'll take them on a hike into the woods with a park ranger and figure out the connections between environmental science and art and break down the walls. They're stepping up and getting it done and doing it in a way that is not just getting it done, but doing it in an awesome way. 90% of people taking on the model of smart goal, saying, I get that this is where we're going. How can I participate and figure things out? People showing up for lead learner workshops, which are not mandated meetings. They're extra meetings on a teacher schedule, which is already packed and booked, not only with school stuff, but with home and family stuff. It's people showing up, you know, the stat of over 50 educators, I think is low, who participated in food for thought lunches. They give up a lunch block to come and talk to our kids. We've had 60 people shadowing, um, allow kids to shadow them over the course of the past two years. This doesn't just happen everywhere. And you know, we were on, we shared out, we were on a podcast recently, sharing the work of NITMUC with a national audience. And I talked about lead learner workshop as a pretty simple idea. It's a simple idea. You know, get rid of your old school meeting and replace it with a meeting for everyone. And the, the moderator of the conversation came back and said, you call it simple, but it doesn't happen like that everywhere. And I, I want to reiterate that this is a special thing. There are people show up that they're invested and that they're taking risks and chances with us. And we're excited and grateful. So that was kind of looking back, which leads into the looking forward. Not that we stole it from Paul, but we're stealing from Paul tonight, too. So this year is really focused on three things, one of those being the portrait of a learner and, and embedding our work into um, connecting it to that. So when we talk about the 21st Century Learning Conferences, what we have there is a non-traditional, active, fun, different kind of learning experience that has real value and connects to the portrait of the learner. And what we have in that is a template that we think we can bring to other classes as well. We recognize the realities of school. We've got to get kids to get good SAT scores. We've got to get them the transcripts they need to get into college. But we also recognize that we have, a, as a community, articulated a pretty awesome aspirational vision for school. And that means that we need to start taking some action steps to make it a, a little more like that aspirational vision. And we think a, a bite-sized way to do that is through the concept of learning adventures. Think of um, the 21st Century Learning Conference sessions that are active and fun and non-traditional, and capture the spirit of that and bring it into the classroom. So that over the course of this year, some of the most important and significant and time-consuming work our teachers are taking on is that in each of their courses, they're creating a learning adventure. They're creating an experience in Algebra One, in US Two, in Italian, in French, in PE, that allows them to take that idea of the 21st Century Learning Conference and connect it to the curriculum. So what we can do through this is we can create a series of experiences where kids are, as I had one, one teacher tell me today, she's excited for this because she's imagining an anatomy and physiology doing sort of a TV show house come to life where we create an emergency room and kids are coming in and the doctors have to take, the kids are doctors having to take their knowledge. That is gonna feel real, it's gonna be active, fun, it's gonna be engaging, and it's gonna take a lot of work to create, but it's a way to do the same thing that we were doing in the curriculum in a new and a different way. The crime scene investigation is another one that we have where you got uh, mock crime scene happening in crime, uh, in patterns of crime and justice. The forensics class does the organization and they bring it to the AP US history class for the trial, where teachers are getting called and brought in on trial. There are a number of things that exist here already but having a shared definition of what would make something a learning adventure is what's going to be powerful for us. And what we'll be able to do even more. Sure. So we're excited about our next lead learner workshop in October where we're going to come together with our students and faculty members and really define learning adventures. But when we're thinking learning adventures, we know that they're going to be tied to our beliefs and definition of learning, connected to the portrait of a learner that's so important for our students, be non-traditional like John talked about, 
um, interdisciplinary. So this idea that when we're creating these adventures, we're tying in um, multiple disciplines because things outside of school don't happen in disciplines. Have them be fun and active, multi-age, so tying in multiple ages, connected to our community. There's so many great resources. Tied into our ideas of modern learning with agency, inquiry, and real work that matters. So this is our guiding premise for learning adventures, but we're really excited about that lead learner workshop where we're going to dig in together. Um, the other piece, we talked about a new student learning goal. Um, this is a model goal this year that we put out to our teachers and we're just starting our goal meetings with educators. So um, we're not sure how many are going to adopt the goal, but all teachers are participating in the creation of learning adventures. And this is really kind of guidelines and action steps that helps them work alongside their students to co-create these experiences. Rather than saying to the teacher, we need you to create this, tapping into the student's creativity and interest and saying, here's the curriculum. If you look at this, where do you see opportunities for adventure? Where do you see opportunities to practice those portrait of a learner competencies? And then working with students to create something, get some feedback from teams of teachers and students and iterate it some and get it to a point where we have this bank of learning adventures that kids get excited about. And so think about it through the eyes of a freshman, incoming freshman coming into high school, and you've got this school term of portrait of a learner, and what does it mean for you? Well, we imagine being able to sit with that freshman and saying, you're gonna be able to chart your, your own adventure. You're gonna choose your own adventure of how you wanna learn the competencies. And you're looking at all the courses you can take in your four years, and you're picking the adventures that match up with your interests, your curiosities. It's gonna happen in your courses, it's gonna happen during the inspired learning days, and you're gonna hopefully be able to create some of your own during the course of your four years. So by linking this into the program of studies, it's taking something that was a powerful two days of learning and incorporating it into our school day and our program of study. I, th I think one of the themes that we hope you see in the work that we're organizing is tangible. Tangible progress where you can feel from one year to the next there's a clear step forward, whether it's the scholars from last year or the reflective tool from last year um, to moving forward to this year where now those things are going to become the building blocks that allows us to embed this into spirit of innovation and the, the, the spirit of Thrive into all of our courses. And I think it's going to be a nice tangible way to get our kids even more excited about coming to school. So that's goal one, focus on portrait of a learner. Um, there's two others. Um, second one focuses on social emotional learning and supporting all students. So some of the work that's happening there, Maureen already talked about, the continuation of the Excel network. Um, having a building-based SEL team, which is something that we hadn't jumped on with yet. Other schools I know in district had started that work as part of the work um, to do a self-assessment as a faculty in terms of social-emotional learning and sharing strategies at faculty meetings. As being part of the Excel network and sending teachers to um, these workshops, they're going to have the opportunity to learn practices and embed them in their classroom. So our hope is that we can learn from each other through sharing of best practices. Um, a relationship mapping activity which focuses on ensuring that every student at Nipmuc Regional has a connection um, with an adult in this building and figuring out ways to strategize for those that may not have as many as others. Our signs of suicide programming is going to continue with a refresher course for our juniors and then as well we're going to have the incoming sophomores be a part of that programming. Um, as Maureen said, the focus on self-care and mindfulness with our teachers with the Onward book study. Um, and then another portion, there's two action steps focused on co-teaching and data and coming up with some common definition and language around um, special design instruction to be ensure we have a common understanding of that and we're providing the supports for students. Highlights from goal three, which is uh, focusing on, well, we have the portrait of the learner, and that's a big part of goal one. There's a lot else that we have going on, so we wanted to take the next step and sort of close in the gap between what we believe and what we practice. So we have another set of collaborative learning opportunities. We put out a doc to our teachers each fall that has we learners, shadow, lunch and learns, and those are filling up and teachers are including those in their goals, so it's exciting to see that continuing. The last lead learner workshop, we began building our glossary of NetMuck specific terms, our lexicon of learning, we're calling it, which is, um, the list of things that are NITMUC specific that not only help to communicate the story and the journey that we're on, but also help to reaffirm the values that's driving each of our work. So that's work is underway. Lunch and Learns, as Marianne mentioned a little bit earlier, sessions that will have similar food for thought, but we think are gonna be a little less 
um, are going to be more, more conducive for drop-ins, where kids are going to be featuring the things that they do so well. Supporting departmental priorities. Uh, each of the departments, as I mentioned last year, came up with their priorities for this year that align with our beliefs about learning and who we want to be as a school. So providing them with the support to do that. Norm setting, particularly in the area of technology, taking that next step and teaching digital citizenship and helping our kids to understand what it means to be a tech user. So that's not only working productively in the classroom environment, but setting some norms that will help them move into an employment setting. The school counseling curriculum, looking now for opportunities to not treat it as a pullout, separate from all the other work we're doing, but embed it in courses and embed it in classes. Pilot internships, we'll be looking to set up in, uh, internships for groups of upperclassmen run by our Career Community and Innovation Coordinator, Leanne Ramsey. She's been doing a lot of research and focusing in on other schools. Maynard has an interesting program, and Sutton High School has been very generous to us in sharing their ideas. She's called the best of their programs and is looking to pilot something for this coming year. And then the continuation of Legacy, which is the fourth iteration of a course that started a little while ago. I love that it changes every year. I love that it's a little bit different. Last year, this was what we call IQ interest, inquiry, and innovations. We had uh, a lot of feedback about what worked and what we could adjust. Changes were made to the schedule. Changes were made in order to make it more flexible. And I think also to put kids' interest and curiosities at the front of it. Uh, we have two sections this year. And we're really excited about this model that we think is going to continue to grow and be a great option for kids moving forward. So those are our three goals. We also wanted to share kind of unofficially one of our goals this year, too, is about communication. Um, and increasing our communication. I know there's a new website and a new platform for communicating, uh, but we have also increased our social media presence on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, so we've been putting out regular posts almost daily um, on all three of those platforms uh, just to get information out, get more information out to the community, share the things that are happening here at NIPMA with the community, everything from details about the DECA Club Activity Fair schedule, so students are receiving that, and that's critically important to them, to recaps of our Lead Learner Workshop, sharing with our community the work that we're doing here in order to bring the district and our school's vision to life. You'll see some dinner time conversations that we plan to post every Monday. So just to be present, get people thinking, tapping into um, you know, their curiosities as well. So we've been marketing this quite a bit. We're at NIMUC Regional for all of our platforms, so there's consistency there, so people are able to find us rather quickly. The other piece that we've done this year, Oh, sure, yeah, so we also switched over to a new platform for our newsletter. Uh, previously, we had news and information published on the blog every two weeks. It was good, um, but we're also hearing from people that when they look for information, they go to their feed. And so we wanted something that was a little bit dy more dynamic. So we're publishing out every two weeks a newsletter on top of the three pl uh, platforms and the blog. The newsletter's been working pretty well. Um, what's nice about it for us is we're able to see some traffic. So I think the number was 560, so that was the last edition got 560 views. So that's good for us to see that the word is getting out. We're hitting people from hopefully that wherever they want to find information, they can get it. The blog is inclusive. Everything that goes out essentially ends up on the blog, oftentimes with more paragraphs than people are going to read, and we know that. But the information's there if they want it, and it's hopefully very transparent for them. And then social media, quick hitters, you're able to see it fast, link out if you want to find some more information. And it's not just the info, my experience said, like things like the dinner time conversations, um, where today we posted about, you know, it's homecoming, picture month, and uh, back to school night. Parents, you want to talk to your kids about stories from your high school or not, <laughs> or share your high school picture. Um, last week it was about you know what we can learn, what can we learn from Rob Gronkowski's decision to walk away from football and self-care, and hopefully just getting people talking about some of the themes and the interests that we have going on here at school, so that it's that natural connection from what happens at Network every day to what happens around the table. That's it. Questions. So all of those, all of those links or the links, the tags are all lined up with NIPMUC Regional. Yes. Instagram, yes, Twitter, at least it's dozen tags. That, I, right. <laughs> that was one of the changes we made was to get rid of all the different handles and go just right. with that NIPMUC Regional. So the s'more is at NIPMUC Regional, Twitter, Facebook. So especially like the sports are definitely spread all over the place. I think there's, <laughs> there's, um, I think there's a few. There's, there's, there's a few. <laughs> you got to search around for them, I guess. But yeah, that, that's a. This is a really cool plan. Um, I was wondering about the departmental priorities. That sounds very interesting. 
Yeah. Is there any way you can share those with us? Sure. So uh, part of this came through uh, taking one of the protocols that we worked on strategic planning, uh, the Back to the Future protocol, if you remember doing that. And we did this with each department, um, department chairs led it, where they said, okay, let's look ahead, it's 2019, let's look ahead to 2024. What does it look like when you look back at 2019, what are you surprised we were still doing? So that's a, a nice prompt to get people in the headspace. Beyond, in addition to that, throughout the course of the year, we did a what if protocol early in the year, where um, the nice way departments work together in a circle and the what if, what if, what if, and you challenge some of the assumptions we make about school. And then the other piece that we did was we um, took the beliefs about learning, uh, part of our definition of learning, which is about 30 sentences, um, which we're going to be communicating out in a really cool way. It's short. Um, and we took them out individual sentences and gave every teacher the opportunity to pick the one that resonated most with them, tell the story that connects to your personal life and why it resonates, and then think, okay, if this is what we believe, this is something we should probably stop doing, and this is something we should do more of. And so through the course of those meetings, you come up with like amazing ideas. And when we got back to talk about the department of priorities, it was look at those three things, synthesize them, and where do you want to go? And we did it with a protocol called the, the Game of 35. You want to talk about that? Sure. So departments essentially took all of their work from the year, right? That what if stuff, big pie, pie in the sky thinking and then connect it to the definition of learning and beliefs because that was critically important. Then that back to the future, where do I want to be? And then boiled it all the way down to multiple goals. Everyone in the department wrote what they felt that they wanted their goal to be. And so they came, you know, seven or eight members per department, they came up with those. And then in a game of 35 where you match up the two ideas and we assign a point value to them and then switch up the ideas to more people join them. So you go through a protocol where they're matching ideas saying, is this more of a priority or is this one more of a priority? They can assign seven points, zero points, you know, they can go three, four. We don't let them split. We can't do three and a half, three and a half. We'd end it right where we started. Um, and choosing the priorities that were most important to them and then helping them go through, if this is our priority as a department, what are the action steps that fall under that? So our departments right now are at the process where they're finalizing those. Um, and as soon as they're finalized, we're happy to share those. That would yeah, it's a quick, quick uh, broad stroke, broad, broad brush overview of them. English department was interested in the creation of a writing center. So connecting students to each other, the you know power of student to student um, teaching. I don't know if that was the one they landed on in the end, but I remember that conversation. Sure. Science is very interested in climate change and connecting so many of the courses to this discussion of uh, global climate change and how can they bring that in with connections to the real world. Um, Math is interested in exploring like their curriculum and finding the space for project-based learning and connecting it to the real world. So that's a struggle that we've been talking about with high school math for a while, but they're interested in exploring that. Science is, I mean, history is really interested in some interdisciplinary work. So finding the natural connections between our history curriculum and science or math or English, because we know they exist in planning some interdisciplinary units and or lessons over the course of the year. Yeah. So what's cool about it too is you can point in every single one of those things, you can point to something in our strategic plan and in our definition of learning that is the driver of it, that's the compass point, and it's all different and it's reflective of where they're at and where they want to go. I think some departments may use it as a guide for common planning, maybe some will use it as you know, the creation of the teacher goals, but um, when we talk about supporting it, it's being smart about the resources, getting the time they need to work on it, coming and meeting and offering guidance. Um, and just hopefully seeing where it's going to go. There's a quote that we talk about sometimes that change happens really slowly until it doesn't. And you know, I think we're at the cusp of things really starting to progress very, very quickly as people take the ideas and run them. Cool. Any other questions? That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. So now to new business. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. We have to go to approve it. Thank you. Uh, all right. So, um, so may I get a um, a motion to uh, to approve the the uh, Misco Hill and New Nipmuc School Improvement Plans? I move that we approve the Misco Hill and. Regional High School School Improvement Plans for 2019-2020. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Any opposed? All right. Passes unanimously. All right. So next is uh, next is the approval of the Nipmuc field trip grants for April 2021. Okay, so you have in your packet all of the, the materials from uh, a provider that we use extensively, of Explora Cup, um, and also the background material, and as far as the itinerary for the trip, which will be April 14th through April 23rd of not this coming spring, but the following spring, 2021, um, and aptly um, I know that you guys usually approve these trips well in advance, um, and this is no case. Uh, this is the same exact case. So tonight we've got uh, two outstanding teachers, uh, Madame Le Maire, and we'll say Mademoiselle Reardon, oh. <laughs> Bonsoir. Oh, yeah. And um, I don't know if you guys want to just give a brief overview. Sure. All right, so for those who don't know me, I teach Italian, not French. So we have our wonderful French teacher here. Um, and she's been wanting to do a trip, and I'm the one who leads the trips kind of to every, everywhere else, so I've been helping her and getting her, uh, her feet wet in traveling with students. Um, so we decided, and she decided, on the Paris trip with the Côte, Côte d'Azur. That's not for sure. All right, and, um, and then a little bit of Italia, which makes me happy, of Cinque Terre, get a little bit of Northern Italy in there. And she's been here, this her fourth year, so she's had a whole, she's gone through a whole grade of students that are very excited to get to Paris and to get to France. And so that's why we decided. Okay. No, I think that's what <laughs> Yeah, they're, they are really eager to, to get over and practice what they've learned and see all the sites. So, yeah. April vacation. That's the price. That will be the price till the end of October. That's with the $200 off. After that, it'll only go up to the 36, and then it stays there for everybody else if they don't sign up by then. Um, it is very early. I know we're talking about 2021, but I like to get here so everyone gets this, the best price they can. And if they choose the monthly payments, they're small and people can do that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I've used Explorica. This is my 11th student trip here. So I've used Explorica for all of them. They're a great company, very helpful. So I haven't decided on changing or anything. Well, should we approve? That's the question. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Sir. So anybody, anybody want to make a motion to approve the trip? Has everybody read the materials for stuff? Okay, good. So, um, can I get a motion to approve the trip? I move that we approve the Nitmuck field trip to France, April 2021. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Aye. None. Okay, triple Thank triple. You so you know, mm -hmm. so Thank you very much. On to old business. Do you have any old business? There is none, at least not on my, on my end. Correspondence, anyone? Correspondence? Yeah. Okay. So any other matters not anticipated by the committee within 48 hours of the posted meeting? I don't have anything. So uh, the future agenda items. Um, up on October 7th is the superintendent's annual evaluation. Um, so with that, I think we should get a motion to um, adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Adjourn. 825.